Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, and um, you mentioned the time distance. Uh, I'm far enough north that it's still quite uh, quite sunny out here. So, uh, and it's late enough of the year that um, it's not a not terribly noticeable. Uh, I'm just gonna start sharing my screen now. Can you all see this? Yes. Uh, good. So I'd like to first thank uh, both Lisa Doyle and Alexander Thing for the opportunity to speak to there. Uh, today. I'm, uh, as, was, as was mentioned, I, my name is Gregory Darwin, and I'm currently employed at Uppsala University, but before coming here, I was, work, I was, employing it, I was employed as a postdoc at the RAC-funded project Classical Influence in Irish Culture at Aarhus University, just south of the Odesund. And there I was working mostly on classical illusions and comparisons as made, as made within the body of early modern Irish literature, with a special interest in the body of early modern uh, Irish political verse that's commonly assumed under the category of bardic poetry. It's a decent amount of material to cover within what's probably going to be a 45 minute talk. So I'm probably, I am going to brush over some things a little bit quickly. So if there's any context which is missing or anything which is unclear, I'd be happy to elucidate things more in the uh, question period. But I'm going to start by unpacking my title a little bit. Uh, we have two quotes here. The first uh, one is from a modern author and one from a medieval author, and both consist of a explicit comparison or act of identification between a classical hero and a figure from the native Irish uh, historical or literary tradition. Um, I'm going to start with the second of these, uh, the Irish Achilles. And this is a comparison which is made by a few scholars within the 19th and 20th centuries. Uh, probably best, well, it's probably best known from uh, Miles Dillon's uh, early Irish literature, which I have the really the wrong date for it's 1948, not 2014. That must have been my uh, the reprint I have. But um, this is a comparison made explicitly by Dylan, but also earlier by Alfred, uh, not David, not rather. Um, uh, and Michael Clark refers to this as a scholarly com commonplace of comparing the worlds of classical epic with Irish saga, uh, but both fairly um, unproblematically make an equation between Cuchulain, the great hero of the Ulster cycle and um, Achilles, the Greek hero that figures prominently in the, uh, the Iliad. And uh, for Nutt, at least, this is the similarity seen within a cultural evolutionary framework as both the, uh, the Irish saga material and the classical epic, the Homeric epic, are seen as reflecting a similar stage of cultural development from a sort of ancient and European inheritance. Whereas for Miles uh, Dillon's assessment, this is more, this seems to be more of an impressionistic uh, claim uh, exactly what he's saying, what he's trying to do with this comparison is not entirely clear, but this is still nonetheless a comparison which is made again and again in the works of uh, 20th century critics. The second of these, the metaphorical Hector, is a comparison which is made by a medieval author uh, of a text that is known as the Coca Gael Regalov, the Battle of the Gales against the Foreigners, um, which is an account of the Battle of Clontarf, which I'm sure many of those of you coming from Dublin will be well aware of, but for those of you who are not familiar with this episode, with this episode of Irish history, it's a battle between Purian Borova O'Kineda, uh, or Brian Baru as he's known in English, against uh, the, a, a force of, it's a mixed force, but it's been portrayed in popular historiography as being a force of the Vikings, the Lothamy, the descendants of uh, Scandinavian settlers in Ireland. And this episode uh, is reworked, uh, this takes place in the early 11th century, but is reworked in the 12th century into this lengthy narrative, uh, the Koga Gael Regalov. And within this story, within this account, um, Murachev, the son of Brian Borowa, is slain in the battle. But first, before this happens, he's likened to Hector in two very elaborate and ornate rhetorical passages. Um, and I'll just quote the first, pass the first of these right now, and I'll talk about the second of these later on. At the head of these was the matchless, ever victorious Hector, of the many nations heroic children of Adam, Nili Murchad, son of Brian, the Yew of Ross, of the Princes of Erin, the head of the valor and bravery, and chivalry, munificence, and liberality, and beauty of the men of the world at his time and his career. For the historians of the Gael do not relate that there was any uh, that there was any man of the sons of Adam in his time who could hold a shield and mutual interchange of blows with him. Uh, we have two extant recensions of this text. One survives in the 12th century manuscript known as Lauer Lion, the Book of Leinster. But this is this breaks off considerably before this episode in the text. We have 
the full text in a slightly different recension in uh, much later manuscripts, but it's generally thought this recension can be, can be dated to at least a very close uh, descendant of a 12th century original. So it seems like this episode is, is occurring at that point and the 12th century will be significant later on. But I wanna call our attention to this phrase which is translated by Todd as matchless, ever victorious Hector. In techter, in tal, in tal il vuvach. Um, yes, uh, this same, this word which I have in bold, in tal is one which later on Todd, which, this is one which Todd translates as matchless, but later on translates the same term as metaphorical. And this is derived from uh, the, pre the preverbal or the, pre the prefix in, which is uh, often used for verbals of necessity or um, adjectives derived from verbs, which indicate a capability of something being done in Irish. And it's derived as well from the verb savlighith, which is derived from the simple preposition, or from the noun savl and the preposition, uh, which is derived from the dative of the noun, which is cognate with uh, Latin simil, for example, similis. Um, so that which can be compared is what is, is meant here. So the translation of matchless is kind of uh, curious here. Um, metaphorical, I think, conveys what is intended by this uh, much better. But in juxtaposing these two, uh, these two quotations, these two comparisons, I'm being somewhat cheeky in suggesting that the work of medieval literati in Ireland and modern literary critics isn't at times all that different. Both are attempting to make sense of the past, um, especially an Irish past, throughout a classical frame, through a classical frame of reference and are attempting to elevate the the tradition, the literary tradition, the historical tradition of Ireland in reference to a classical one. And we'll explore that more in the next little while, but uh, I'm gonna start by pointing out that there has been an increased uh, interest in medieval Irish literati's awareness of classical tradition and their sort of conscious use of that within the past, uh, the past 20 years or so. And there are two relatively recent publications. On the, on the left, we have uh, Brett Miles' uh, Heroic Saga and Classical Epic in Medieval Ireland, published in 2011. And on the right, we have an edited volume, Classical Learning and Classical Literature and Learning in Medieval Irish Narrative, edited by Ralph O'Connor in 2014. And I'll be drawing upon these two works heavily and works published um, by some of the authors who are represented in Ralph O'Connor's volume. So before turning to some of my examples, I wanna give just a brief, very brief overview of awareness of classical learning in medieval Ireland. And I'm gonna be very brief since I'm not an early medievalist. This is very much outside my comfort zone. So if I do make mistakes, please forgive me. Um, but we start um, with the awareness that Ireland was never part of the Roman Empire. So the the classical inheritance is very different in Ireland than it is in many other parts of Europe where it's more of a direct continuity with, uh, with, with Roman rule. Since Ireland wasn't uh, part of the Roman Empire, um, knowledge of Latinity and of the classical oh, tradition, the pre-Christian classical tradition comes mostly via the church. There is some possible evidence for pre-Christian uh, interactions with a more vernacular Latinity that comes from trade and interaction with the Roman province of Britannia, which was the nearest island, as well as with the Roman province of Gallia um, on the continent. Um, and this is possibly to be seen in the earliest Ogham inscriptions, which is a, an Irish monumental script, which can be compared quite fruitfully to uh, runic inscriptions in that they're meant to be carved on rock and the extant corpus consists of fairly short, fairly formulaic inscriptions. In Irish, it's mostly just personal names. Um, but the arrangement of the Ogham uh, alphabet, shall we say, seems, as Damien McCannessis argues, seems fairly clearly to indicate familiarity with not just the Latin script, but also the Latin grammatical tradition and the way the letters are, are arranged. We can also point to several very early borrowings in Old Irish that mostly relate to trade and material culture and are sometimes thought of as being pre-Christian, although this is not necessarily the case because monasteries still had a need for things like wine and cheese and units of measure, for example. But this evidence for much broader engagement with Latin literacy, which occurs, um, like I said, via the church, um, engagement with biblical and patristic texts, as well as a need for communication with the, with the church in other parts of the world. And because Latin, as I mentioned, was never, because Ireland, as I mentioned, was never part of the Roman Empire, Latin was never a spoken language there, except with the possible exception of people who had interactions regularly with other part, with Latin speaking areas, so merchants. Besides that, Latin was never a vernacular language. And so 
with the church, it becomes learned as a second language. And we see in Ireland and places where there's an Irish cultural impact, uh, diaspora, we could say, uh, there are innovations in the way that Latin is taught and these antique traditions of teaching grammar and rhetoric, which assume that one is being, that the person being taught is a, a native speaker of Latin have to be modified and they are indeed modified. And this is sometimes pointed out or invoked as an explanation for the medieval Irish reputation of being quite skilled in biblical exegesis. But we find Latin writings being produced in Ireland unambiguously from the sixth century on, probably earlier, in genres such as epistolography, hagiography, poetry, and as I mentioned, biblical exegesis. And much of it is characterized by a fairly learned, ostentatious, and quite pedantic tone. And this style of writing is often referred to as Hesperic, uh, Hesperic uh, Latin, um, a name that's derived from uh, the Hispiatic Thamina, a series of a poetic um, composition from the sixth or seventh century. So there's an open question as to what extent the Irish were aware of the classical tradition, by which I mean pagan classical authors specifically, so poets such as Virgil, Ovid, and so on, and to what degree they can be said to have known more about this than their neighbors at the time. So the, if you'll forgive the pun, locus classicus for this question is a letter by the English monk Althelm to a prospective student, Whitfrith, or who is cautioning him against studying in Ireland, in the monastic schools there. And it's, I'll just quote the English, but it's, it's delightfully pearl-clutching. Uh, what I eagerly ask is the benefit what I eagerly ask is the benefit to the sanctity of the Orthodox faith, to labor in the reading study of filthy proserpina's defiled incest. One shrinks from mentioning it openly, or to revere through the commendation that, that follows study, Hermione, the lascivious offspring of Menelaos and Helen, who, as ancient works tell, was engaged once by right of dowry to Orestes, then, having changed her mind, married Neoptolemus, or to record in the heroic style of the epic the priests of, Lu of the Luperci, who revel like those cultists who make offerings to Priapus. So this conveys uh, in, as I mentioned, as I said, very outraged, uh, in a very outraged tone, this conveys the impression of an Irish curriculum, which Althelm was clearly familiar with if he's able to make these references, but which places a particular focus on the study of pagan authors. And this, along with other comments by Althelm elsewhere, um, are used by many modern critics to suggest that the Irish had a particular interest in the works of pagan authors in, in the early Middle Ages. Um, and a fairly extreme form of this narrative that some of you may be familiar with is the idea that the Irish have saved civilization, which formed the title of a book, of a popular book by, say, by Thomas Cahill, which some of you may be familiar with. But by the ninth century, there is ample evidence for Irish engagement with uh, pre-Christian classical learning. Um, we can point to numerous examples of this, but uh, the Carolinian Peregrini, uh, so Irish scholars who went to the continent to work among other places in the courts of uh, Charlemagne, Louis the Pious, uh, and, and other Carolingian monarchs. Um, we also find old Irish glossing in, so the, lang the, the, old, the early, an early stage of the Irish language, we find old Irish glossing in Latin manuscripts which show an extensive engagement with uh, works of pre-Christian Lat Latinity. Um, one of these is the St. Gall Christian. Um, as the name indicates, it's a copy of, Prish, of Prishan's Institutiones, his grammar, which references and quotes Virgil and various other, various other pre-Christian authors. This was probably compiled in Latin or written in, in Ireland in the first half of the ninth century and contains, as I mentioned, extensive old Irish glossing, glossing on Prishan's text, um, which shows a clear engagement with this, with, um, this style of Latin learning. And, Another manuscript we can mention is the Reichenau Primer, which uh, was probably composed on the continent, but shows, again, extensive Old Irish glossing. Among other things, it has a series of grammatical declension tables for Greek. And this, in addition to various works of grammar and, uh, and astronomy, we have um, a lot of Old Irish um, annotations. Gl glosses might be a bit of a stretch to call them, but um, extensive text in Old Irish, including a number of poems, and some of you may be able to make out on the bottom right here, the first line, Misha August Pangerban. This is where the very well-known Old Irish poem about the scholar and his cat is found, for example. Following the ninth century, there's less um, 
direct manuscript evidence for engagement with Latinity in Ireland, but there's no reason to suspect that uh, familiarity with these authors ever really went away. And on the other hand, we can point that uh, we can point out that um, vernacular adaptations of classical literary works begin to appear in Irish at around this time, um, in this um, sort of beginning of this millennium. So just to go over some of the major texts that we have, um, the probably one of the, the more prolific of these, or the more well known in terms of manuscript. Uh, Witnesses is Thalhul Tri, The Destruction of Troy, which is a translation of Pseudo Darius Phrygius' uh, prose account, De Excidio Troia Historia, uh, which is attributed to Darius Phrygius, who is supposedly a uh, Trojan priest who was an eyewitness to the, to the war. Um, because of this ostensible eyewitness account, it, has, it enjoys a certain amount of authority in the Middle Ages and becomes um, both because of this um, authority that it has and because it's written in Latin, becomes the sort of standard account of the Trojan War, as opposed to um, Homer's Iliad, which was not available um, throughout the Latin West. And this exists in three recensions compiled in the 11th, um, 11th 12th, and 12th and 13th century, as well as a 12th century verse adaptation, Louis Iason in a ling lore, Jason went in his spacious ship. On, to that, on top of that, we can point out uh, the Shkila Alexander, the Alexander Saga, which is a translation of pseudo calisthenes the Imachta Aeneas, The Adventures of Aeneas, which is a prose adaptation of Virgil's Aeneid, excuse me, um, in Cath Catherva, The Civil War, which is a translation of Lucan's Pharsalia or De Bello Cubile, um, Togol Meseva, The Destruction of Thieves, which is a translation of Statius's Thebaid, although I should note that this title, Togol Meseva, is not actually found in any of the manuscript witnesses, as Mariam Briggs has pointed out, so it's a creation of the text editor to uh, George Calder on the on the basis of Tahul Tri, which is widely tested. Um, we can, there's a few other texts as well. Uh, Robomath Achil Macpel is a versified adaptation of the Achilleid, which is inserted into the third recension of Tahul Tri, and various other uh, retellings that appear in the 12th and 13th centuries with less obvious sources, um, which still nonetheless retell classical narratives in various ways. Um, the uh, medieval Irish seem to take a fairly free attitude towards translation. Um, in respect to, to many of these, um, the degree of faithfulness to their sources obviously varies from text to text, since these are all composed by different authors. And um, but generally, the attitude can be conveyed as more of a historian than that of a literary translator. They are not above fitting in material from other sorts of from other uh, sources, uh, from various glosses on other on other texts from various sort of mythographers. Um, and in many cases, they're quite happy to adapt the structure of some of these texts to fit uh, an Irish sensibility of how narrative works. Um, it, additionally, all of these are, with a few exceptions, all of these are in prose because that's the generic expectation for telling a saga in Irish. So narr extensive narrative verse is just not a thing yet. Um, this is also, we can point, we can observe the same era in which vernacular Irish saga begins to appear or at least lengthier prose compositions. One of the best known of these is the Talon Bolkulna, the Cattle Raid of Cooley, which is the, um, the text in which Cúchulainn, this Irish hero, figures very, very prominently. Um, it's a tale which many of you are undoubtedly familiar with, but it concerns a conflict between the, the Kingdom of Ulster and the rest of Ireland, but predominantly Queen Medhav of Connacht over a bull, of all things. Uh, but it's, it becomes this large-scale conflict and um, this is frequently in 20th century scholarship referred to as, and 19th century referred to as an epic or Ireland's national epic, um, drawing upon the romantic conceit that every nation has to have its own national epic. Um, towards later 20th century, Michael Clark has identified a constructivist turn, so to speak, which is sees the production of these longer sagas in Irish as a response to classical epic. So this goes back all the way to Rudolf Tenison in the 1920s, who in Die Erschen Helden und Königssage argues that the Aeneid had a formative influence on these larger structures, these larger, larger sagas in Irish, especially the Tombow Kulna. More recently, Brent Miles in the book I mentioned argues for the influence of Tothel Tree, this Irish adaptation of classical narrative, on other vernacular works and of various classical and late antique works of 
literature and historiography on the rhetoric and the structure of the Tom Bocullien. What I'm interested in is not so much um, where these texts are coming from or how medieval Irish authors are coming to terms with the classical tradition, but I'm particularly interested in explicit statements by the Irish that make these comparisons uh, and indicate their own thought processes and how they're seeing their own past that they're constructing and reconstructing and how that relates to the, the worlds of the ancient Mediterranean. And I'm going to start off with three examples from the 12th century before turning to um, the body of bardic poetry, which uh, was mentioned at the beginning, this body of early modern political poetry. So the first of these is from a, a poem on Alech in Donegal, this is the site of, of the, the hill fort known as Greenland, Greenland Ali. Um, and this is by a poet known as Flan Manishtach, and this belongs to a corpus of poetry known as the Dimitanachus, the Shanachus, the lore of place names. Um, and the poem is composed by Flan Manishtach. Um, this is the second poem. Um, there's an earlier poem, which, is a which he seems to be attributing to a different poet, Eochid, perhaps to be identified with Eochid, Eoloch Kerenin, who was a very renowned poet in the, 12th, in the 11th century. But he begins the poem with this uh, doublet. Uh, and I'll just read the English. Whoever attempts the telling of the story of Alech of the herds after the noble Eochid, the former poet, it is robbing the sword from the hand of Hercules. So this seems to be fairly, this is a very interesting statement of authorial intent or perhaps uh, philosophy of composition, but this statement may seem very, very familiar to some of you and for good reason. Um, it echoes one that's given by Jerome, who is repeating in, in an introduction to uh, his commentary on uh, Genesis, uh, repeating an episode uh, attributed to the life of Virgil about Virgil's plundering of the ancient authors, um, especially of Homer. And again, I'll just read the English in the interest of time, but um, uh, Jerome was responding to slanders that he is a plagiarist, essentially, and he points out that Terence, uh, just as Terence has to defend himself, he feels the need to defend himself. Um, for Lucius Manuinus, uh, just like our Lucius pursued with vigor and accused the poet of being a thief of the public tre treasury. The bard of Mantua, i.e. Virgil, also suffered the same from his rivals because he translated certain lines of Homer word for word. He was called a plunderer of the ancients, compilator veterum. He replied to them, it, it takes great strength to wrench the club from the hand of Hercules. Magnarum esiguirium, clavum herculi extorquere de manu. And Abigail Bernier has amply shown that this was something of a commonplace within the Middle Ages, this uh, as an approach to uh, literary criticism, we could say. Um, um, and this relates to the medieval idea of compilatio as a process of uh, cre uh, textual creation. Um, compilatio is obviously related to the English word compilation, um, from which it is derived, but the, the basic sense of the term in Latin, compilo, is to plunder, to raid, um, and then to gather together the things that have been raided. And from there, it takes on the, the secondary meaning of uh, a collection of things, or perhaps collection of accounts or documents, uh, but in a bit of a pejorative term. Um, but when we turn to a source that would have been very familiar to the Irish, um, the Spanish cleric Isidore of Seville's etymologies, we find this account, this sort of attempt to rehabilitate the term. Um, compilator, one who mixes things said by others with his own words as pigment makers are, as pigment makers are accustomed to pound together various mixes in a mortar. So um, Isidore, Isidore's etymologizing consists of breaking the word down into its constituent parts to find meaning in here. And here um, the implication is that compilator is not from the verb pilo, but from the noun pila, a basin or a, a mortar. Um, so one is mortaring things together. And then the Mantuan poet, i.e. Virgil, was once accused of this crime when translating certain verses of Homer, he blended them in with his own and was called a plunder, compilator of the ancients by his rivals. He replied, it takes great strength to wrench the club from the hands of Hercules. So this passage has obvious relevance for the Irish adapters of classical material. They are plundering slash compiling classical and late antique narr narrative accounts in order to produce their own adaptations as well, perhaps as their own native tales, things like the Talon, which are based off of this tradition in various ways. But the extension of this classical approach to um, 
So that we have this extension of a classical approach to, or late antique approach to textual scholarship that's being brought to bear on native tradition. But it's also striking, and this seems to be a statement of what the poet is doing here with, with his attitude towards his own sources that have nothing really to do with classical tradition necessarily. But it's striking as well, the poet is equating himself rather unproblem. He's equating himself with Virgil and his predecessor, Elchiz, with Homer. This is, of course, very, very flattering for Elchiz, treating him as this authority, perhaps, but it's also, as Bernier points out, maybe a bit of a backhanded compliment, because um, by claiming to be the Virgil in this equation, he is, um, in a sense, improving upon and, uh, in a real sense, erasing the that which has gone before, because um, within Western Europe in the early Middle Ages, Virgil was the account of the Trojan War that they had, uh, and Homer was inaccessible. So the second of these examples I want to point out is a historical poem that was written during the reign of Elchith Macdun Heva, uh, who reigned 1158 to 1166. And the opening quatrains of this poem, you can see here um, a much later uh, scribe, um, probably a 17, probably an 18th or 19th century antiquarian has written a poem reciting the Christian kings of Ulster, uh, giving a summary of it for, um, sorry, whatever librarian would have needed to look at this. But the opening quatrains of this poem have attracted a lot of attention in these discussions of Irish awareness of the classical past and Irish reimaginings of the classical past. past. Um, and I'm gonna just read again, in the interest of time, just the English, uh, children of Olive, um, are the nobles of Evan, the Ulstermen of Broad Schley of Lyric. Very generous, vic victorious race of Ir, they are the true Trojan band of Ireland. Also the province of Ardadol, are the fair Dal Fiabach, the descendants of great Erevon, sons of Fiachna Fargas seed with numerous shields with fierce exploits. So we establish right away an analogy between the Ulster cycle or the heroes of the Ulster cycle, the cycle of tales, which includes uh, the Tombo Kulna and um, the heroes of the Trojan War. Um, who are introduced within the first quatrain. And the second quatrain, we have this, we point out the mutual origin of the Olive, the Ulstermen, and um, the dynasty to which this king, Elchid Dunchleva, belongs. Tro im ir, naherin ir. They are the true, um, and this term, tro im, represents perhaps an attempt to re etymologize the term Trojan as a Troy. Fian, a Fian being a native Irish term for a warrior band. But we, have, we see here in the manuscript a variant reading here, Trojan the Nahirn Yet, simply Trojans of, of Ireland. Um, so that's a, a viable interpretation for the scribe as well. Uh, Asia and Ulster are equally famous indeed in fame and pride. Priam is the name of Conchover of Coddle, who rages arrogantly around northern Troy. Troilus and Cuchulain are equivalent in their combats, their lifespan and their fortune. Aeneas is Fergus, where exile is concerned, a bright constant pair who are not moderate in battle. Some of these direct comparisons may seem fairly obvious to us, others less so. Fergus, uh, i.e. Fergus Macroich, who is the king of the exiles from Ulster in the Tombokulna, is Aeneas. And this is clearly a reflex of the, tradi of the tradition of Aeneas Traditor, Aeneas the traitor. Conchver, the king of the Ulstermen, um, makes an obvious stand in for Priam. Uh, Cuchulain as Troilus is perhaps a little bit unusual to us, but um, this uh, seems to indicate that the, the influence of both Tahul Tri and ultimately the, the source of that, Darius Phrygius's De Excidio Troia Historia, where Troilus plays a much greater role in the narrative as a defender of Troy than uh, he does in the Homeric canon. And indeed in Tahul Tri, Troilus has a, a moment of, shall we say, Aristea, where he is transformed into this monstrous thing that uh, does terrible, terrible violence to the Greek soldiers. And this is a clear parallel with Cuchulain's own distortion, his own riestras. Um, powerful Misha is Alexandros, uh, i.e. Paris. Their splendid beauty caused the siege of Troy in the Tong. Hector is like honest Conal Kernach, a fierce strength against the iron of conflict. Conflict. Each single man of Evan's territory has a counterpoint in tumultuous lordly Troy. It would be pleasant to enumerate them all, every hero of the fair company. So Alexandros or Paris as uh, 
Misha is not a perfect analogy, but it fits. Misha was the young warrior who uh, was made to elope with Deirdre. Um, and upon this, uh, this was the cause of great slaughter, which led ultimately to the Taun happening because, uh, or led to events which uh, set into motion certain events which led the Taun to happen. Hector as Conal Karnach um, is an interesting one as well. Conal Karnach being one of the heroes of the Ulster Cycle who played, see, we're used to seeing um, Kuchalan as the main as the main figure, in part because of his prominence in uh, the Tom Kulna itself. But as Barbara Hillers has pointed out, he actually is the figure who appears the most in these tales, um, and may have been for many Irish audience the sort of protagonist of them. Um, yeah. So these six quatrains, or at least the four which make these explicit comparisons, are. Um, as I mentioned, brought up very, very frequently in these discussions of medieval Irish awareness, the classical tradition. What's brought up less frequently is one later on in the poem. So after this extended analogy between the heroes of the Ulster cycle and the ancient Irish past and the ancient classical past, there's a sort of chronology of kings from just after the reign of the Ulster cycle kings to the present day. And once we've reached the current king, Eochid, we have a series of about um, seven or eight quatrains that are in a panegyric mode on him, praising him for his various qualities. Um, and these are fairly conventional terms of praise within the medieval Irish tradition. He's praised for his martial prowess, the prosperity the land enjoys under him, his physical beauty, his generosity to followers, to his followers, especially to poets, which is not surprising to read in a poem, I suppose. But he's also likened quite explicitly to Hector here. Um, he is the prophesied hero of Lach Kuhn, of the swords, the subject of women's talk, the goal of every bard, the support of Boon Kelleher without decay. Noble Ireland looks to him as her Hector. So the comparison, the three-way comparison, which is made implicit in the second quatrain, is made explicit here. On the one, um, Ulster heroes are like classical heroes, but they're also like contempt, like the martial heroes or the, the kings of the contemporary uh, of contemporary Ireland, at least within the narrow discourse of praise poetry. A third of these examples um, is the one I brought in my title, The Metaphorical Hector. Um, so this is applied not to a figure of the distant past, like the Ulster Cycle, but rather someone who is uh, more within more recent historical memory and a member of the dynasty, which is being propagandized within this work. Um, that is to say, Murchith, son of Brian, Borova or Brian Baru. And so um, I read this, I don't feel the need to read it again, but we have the Intechter, Intavlachtach, Ilvavach, Nahadaplenya, right? The matchless or metaphorical, ever victorious Hector of the many nationed heroic children of Ireland, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and some of these descriptions are, again, not terribly uncommon for uh, panegyric verse, right? being compared to a yew tree or a tree in general is something we find in Irish panegyric as well as Old Norse panegyric. But slightly later on um, in the battle description, there's a much more elaborate and rhetorically in ornate um, description. And I'll just read this first part of it. Um, for this is what the historians of the Gael say, that seven like Murchith, we a match for Mach Samhain, and seven like Mach Samhain, a match for Lu Laha, and seven like Lu Laha, a match for Conal Kernach we just heard about as being another Hector, and seven like Conal Kernach, a match for Lu Lawada, the son of Etzlin, and seven like Lua, Lu Lawada, a match for Hector, the son of Priam. Such the degrees and variations of illustrious championship from the beginning of the world, and there was no illustrious championship previous to Hector, because it was on, an only, infant, only an infant till his time, and was not fit for action, nor shall there be after Merchaz, because it will be a palsied, shriveling, daughtered ever after. And thus in championship in the world are compared with human life according to intellectual metaphor. Ar nintavlachith intlachta. And this is the same word, intavlachith, which gives us this uh, adjective that we're translating as matchless or metaphorical. So Marachiv is, here the comparison is much more complex. Marachiv is not simply Hector, but he is the last in a line of declining he heroes, beginning with Hector as the first hero par excellence. Maureen Nuwina has shown that this is a very expert reworking of a medieval, uh, of an early Christian uh, topos of the six ages of the world, one which was known 
within Irish tradition, but comes to us from various sources, such as the works of Augustine and other early Christian authors. Here, it's reworked to include not only classical heroism, but also various figures drawn from native tradition, Lu Lawada being one of the two of the Te Danan, the gods of Irish tradition, Conal Kernach um, being one of the heroes of the Ulster Cycle, and other figures that are known to us from um, uh, the tradition surrounding Finn McCool. Um, and in the comparison that's being drawn between Mordechai and Hector, Hector is clearly superior to not only him, but also all of these subsequent uh, Irish heroic figures. But nonetheless, there is a sense of a continuity of a tradition that they are heirs to Hector in some way. And this in Tavlachid, as I mentioned, is ver uh, the verbal noun of the verb, which gives us this uh, metaphorical phrase uh, that, you know, that which creates the possibility of comparison or something like that. Niwina argues as well, this may be a vernacular rendering of the Latin term imitatio, specifically in reference to the ancient rhetorical practice. Uh, where am I? And we see this imitatio on display here. Murachid is once again in this passage likened explicitly to classical and biblical heroes in a way which foregrounds the artificial and artistic nature of the passage and signals the author's learning. He is a metaphorical Hector in Techter in Pavlichtach. He is also um, Samson. He is also a second powerful Hercules in Tarkol Totachtach Tanasha um, and a, a little Lawada. Um, so the author in this practice of imitatio is signaling a certain set of generic expectations and certainly does not disappoint. What follows is an epic account of the battle which culminates in a single combat with a Viking warrior, um, the son of the king of Lochlan, who, which results in the deaths of both warriors, um, although Marachid lasts at least till the morning. Um, but the primary point of reference here I wanna point out is not Achilles as with 20th century critics, but Hector and our modern, view of Achilles as the sort of prime or main classical hero, or is probably conditioned by our own reading habits, including the primacy which is given to the Homeric canon of Iliad and the Odyssey. These are texts which, as I mentioned, were not available in the Latin West during the Middle Ages. What texts were available, however, did emphasize the heroism of Hector. And as seen in the last few examples, um, the comparison is made not only between classical heroes and heroes of the ancient Irish past, but also between more recent historical figures or even contemporary ones. So I'm gonna turn now to the body of Irish bardic poetry. And this is um, a very formal and somewhat formulaic uh, body of verse, which was composed in the later middle ages and the early modern period, generally assigned the dates 1200 to 1650. And this can be defined both in terms of form and function. Formally, it is written in what's called don uh, literally direct verse, which is a syllabic verse, a fixed number of syllables per line, with very strict metrical requirements of syllable count and rhyme, as well as extensive requirements for metrical alliteration, uh, internal rhyme, alliteration, assonance, and so forth. Uh, functionally, it is courtly poetry. Poets were patronized by petty kings and, minor, and aristocrats, and the major functions of, the, of this poetry included praise and lament which was meant to further the reputation of the family. This image is from John Derrick's um, Image of Ireland, published in 1581, which is a depiction, this wood plate at least, is a depiction of a feast held by the McSwithna chief before engaging with English forces under the command of Henry Sidney. Um, it, do it doesn't end well for them at all, but this is one of our uh, major contemporary images of what, of what a what this sort of poetic practice would have looked like. Although the question, of course, of Derek's familiarity with it or how many degrees he's removed from it is a bit of, a, of an open question. Um, but we have here um, the chieftain himself seated, the reciter, the harpist, um, and the poet himself instructing the, the reciter um, and kind of giving, uh, presumably something like a modern day conductor giving sort of um, something to do with the rhythm of it. And we also have various preparations of the feast and um, people farting into the fire with a very snarky comment in Latin from, uh, from Derek about how, look at how my parents have reared me. Uh, most, while, the, while Bardic poetry is dated to the period of roughly 1200 to 1650, most of it is um, fairly towards the later end of that, um, that range. 
And this probably has to do more with accidents of manuscript survival and the fact that towards the end of this period in the 17th century, we have sort of with the awareness of the um, pressures on this elite, on this aristocratic culture coming from England and the crown, uh, a sense of salvage mentality that results in larger manuscript compilations such as the Book of the O'Connor Dawn. Uh, and the, la the later sections of this poem on Elchith Dunhueva, which I mentioned, um, the poem that which makes the comparison between the Ulster cycle heroes and the heroes of the Trojan War, we can see this as sort of a proto-bardic poem and one which provides something of a stylistic ancestor for later work, um, especially later comparisons between classical figures and the object of praise. However, um, such comparisons are relatively rare in the body of poetry and also only seem to imagine to emerge uh, towards the end of this period. So here are some figures that I arrived at while working on the postdoctoral project that was mentioned earlier. In total, I was able to find 104 syllabic poems, um, of which 11 are not, are not contained within the Bardic Poetry Database, a extremely useful resource that's uh, hosted by the Dublin Institute for Advanced Studies. Seven of these were composed in the 14th and 15th centuries, 85 in the 16th and 17th, three towards the beginning of the, of the 18th century, and another nine could not be dated, um, in part because these are syllabic poems, but not in reference to any particular patron. These are more sort of occasional verse. And because of the highly formal and conservative nature of the language that's used in this poetry, it's very hard to date them on linguistic grounds. And uh, so they're not dated. Um, because there's no internal evidence. But right off the bat, um, there's a huge difference between the, pop, the relative frequency of classical references in the late Middle Ages versus, what, versus the early modern period. Um, and this is not simply to do with the number of poems that survive. Even when we take that into consideration, there's still a much greater prefer, uh, prevalence of bardic, of bardic poems or syllabic poems, which draw upon uh, classical tradition in some way in the 16th and 17th centuries than there was previously. So uh, we have about 520 poems that survive from the 12th to 15th century, uh, with seven of them containing some sort of classical reference versus nearly double that in the, the next two centuries, but over 7%. So it's it's a fairly noticeable increase. And we can also point out that uh, not only are there more of these references, but the ones that we do have are often more sophisticated and show more of an awareness of classical tradition. Like the earlier references are all to Greece and Troy for the most part, whereas in later poetry, we'll find references to um, you know, more specific characters and in many cases as well, um, characters who are not known in the vernacular tradition of translations or texts which had only recently become aware, uh, become familiar to the Western European uh, milieu. Um, and this uh, stands in stark contrast to received, uh, so this uh, is part of a wider overall European interest in neoclassicism. Um, within the 16th and 17th centuries and other literatures, we can point to an increased interest in classical tradition. Um, and this is, in stark contrast to received narratives we might have about the, shall we say, inherent conservatism of bardic tradition. Um, as I mentioned, the references in later poems are also much more involved uh, and more, shall we say, recherché, uh, not just simple similes or comparisons, but also follow on apologues, uh, narratives that are worked into the poem to draw a sort of allegorical comparison between the present day situation and some narrative drawn from um, from uh, existing tradition, be it classical, biblical, or native literary tradition. And very, very frequently we find that patrons will be, poets will compare patrons or the object of the poem, at least to classical heroes in various ways, but directly. So I'm gonna talk about some of the ways these comparisons are made, and I think I'm okay for time. Um, but I'll kind of read quickly through these and then get to my main point, really. Um, but often the, the patron is identified explicitly as the hero or qualified in some way, the hero with respect to equality or of a certain territory. So just a few examples, uh, Achilles who nourishes battles, uh, lively 
vigorous Hercules of, uh, of malice? Um, or are you Hector of noble aspect? Um, o Hector of, Eastern, of Western Europe? Um, a fairly sophisticated example here, uh, Hector of Inishbra, a bardic name for Ireland, has passed away. Hercules the Gale has perished um, and left the sovereign island of Fall, another name for Ireland without strength. Um, Achilles of Ireland has died. And uh, he is Cato uh, in the shape of his royal mind, Caesar with auspices of battle. Other poets will draw more, uh, the comparison will be more foreground. It'll be a simile in some way or another, um, often using the term sovel or myav, uh, likeness or equal. Um, so his likeness has come, or Hector himself, uh, against the mighty clans of the mighty descendants of Neil. Um, his like was found in Macedon in the time in the time of Alexander. Um, he enters the forward, i.e., he enters the battle like a fair-haired Hector, um, like he like Achilles guarding them, or a fearsome rod like illustrious Hercules. Rarely he's said to surpass even these classical heroes themselves. Um, this also frequently happens within uh, panegyrics, so on, in laments. Um, but neither Hector nor Achilles were able to surpass the uh, fearsome hand, the fearsome and harsh hand of Conqueror, i.e. the dead man. And in the same lament we find uh, not more clever was, was uh, Finn the wise prophet or Cato as a counselor. Um, and then this other person is said to have uh, surpassed um, Hercules, Jason, Pyrrhus, uh, that is the Trojan Pyrrhus and not the Greek general, Hector and Achilles. Uh, the comparison can extend not just to the hero himself, but to attributes connected with him. So uh, one of our patrons is said to have a spear, a narrow spear with which Troy was taken. Um, another is said to the warrior, his re warrior retinue are said to be of, are said to be the, the warriors by whom Troy was taken. Um, comparisons with the, the, the uh, patrons dwelling in Troy are also fairly frequent. Um, that house is the, the like of, uh, of Troy. Um, its fair wall was Troy of Leinster, i.e. the Eastern province of Ireland, in which many of you are right now. And it is like Troy to, it is like supply recounting the tale of Troy to spread your story. And returning to the question of laments, we also find poets likening the patrons territory and the state of the territory, and often Ireland as a whole, to that of various places after the death of, the, of their protecting heroes. So Troy and Hector are quite popular in this respect, as are some others. So, uh, yeah. Uh, addressing, uh, addressing the fortress, uh, you are Troy after Hector. Um, in a poem, Mofrui Marco Creo, uh, which uh, was translated by Patrick Pierce and had a bit of a renaissance in the 20th century, um, like the people of Troy after its destruction in reference to the Irish in general. Um, uh, after the fashion of the Trojans in the East, uh, thus was Troy after the death of Hector. Um, and then a lengthier one, a more elaborate, rhetorically elaborate one, uh, or green sworded Rome after uh, Pompeius Magnus, uh, the wall of defending of Donegal, after the death of her noble sovereigns, uh, the city of Troy um, yonder, um, or France after the Charlemagne of, of, the, of the Gaelic coast, or Greece um, that was in sorrow after the death of Achilles. Now we look to the references themselves, just kind of, again, returning to this uh, quantitative perspective. Um, by far the most popular references in these poems are to Greece and Troy, which is understandable. It's easy to make these without having necessarily an in-depth awareness of classical tradition, um, especially since due to the popularity of Tolkien Three, the vernacular adaptation, um, this must have been just broadly a part of the culture. Um, we also, with the Greek, with the, with the 
propensity of Greek references or references to Greece, we should point out that there is a widely held in the Middle Ages belief that the Irish could claim their descent from Greece. Um, and this seems to be reflected in a lot of the poetry as well. So there's vague references to Gael or egg or things like that, the Gales of Greece. Um, and this is probably um, aided in the poetry by the fact that Gael, Irish, and Greg, a Greek, alliterate, which is one of the metrical requirements of Bardic verse. Uh, but we also find characters that are known from these Middle Irish narratives that are widely that are widely tested, uh, the translations of the Trojan War, the Roman Civil War, and the Alexander material. But of these heroes, of these named individuals, Hector is by far the most popular of them uh, and by far the most commonly referenced um, in this body poetry. And if we also look into uh, non-syllabic poetry from the same period, uh, accentual verse, which is often associated with uh, a more vernacular register of and a less elite um, setting, uh, we note that there, is also, there also are frequent references to, to Hector throughout. So his popularity here would suggest that he is the default frame of reference um, for medieval and late medieval and early modern Irish literati, as opposed to the, um, the 20th and perhaps 21st century tendency to see Achilles as the paragon. And this is in keeping with um, some of the texts I quoted earlier, uh, the Calgo Gael Regalo, for example, and the prevalence of Hector within these Middle, these middle Irish sources. Uh, but I suggest that the popularity of Hector in Bardic poetry is not merely conservatism or antiquarianism, but that this image of Hector as the defender of Troy, and especially the last defender of Troy, was consciously exploited by poets who perceived um, their own culture and elite institutions as coming under threat from um, the crown in the 16th and 17th centuries. And this is my last case study. I want to point to a poem, um, an elegy for Donald Kam O'Sullivan Beira. Um, and he, um, or O'Sullivan Beer, and he was the last uh, bearer of his title to have lived within Ireland. Uh, so he lived around the turn of the 17th century, and he joined the rebel faction in the Nine Years' War, um, took part in the siege of Dunboy, left before the castle was actually taken, and uh, eventually fled to Spain during the flight of the Earls in 1607. There, he was granted a pension by Philip III, whom he had formerly petitioned for help to come to Ireland to bring military aid. This didn't come, but Philip was happy enough to give him a pension, a knighthood, and to maintain the title of Duke of, uh, of Beer, which obviously didn't do him all that much good in Madrid, but at least he probably saw more sun than he would have seen in Kerry. Uh, he was assassinated in 1618 by an Englishman from Dublin, possibly acting on behalf of the crown. And there's an eyewitness accounts of, of this in the writings of Philip O'Sullivan Beer. And we also find um, that he, um, we also find this elegy, this rather lengthy and fairly well-written elegy by Donald McCowan E. Rolla, uh, which is titled Since Spawn the, Ho the Horn of Sever in Spain, Sever, Tara, the site of the ancient Irish kings has fallen. Um, we don't know much about this poet. In fact, this is the only poem that has survived that's attributed to him, but it's clearly a very competent work. And the poet is very deftly weaving the fate of Donal and his tragic uh, circumstances with that of Ireland as a whole and the personal and the political become uh, interwoven in some fairly sophisticated ways. But as I mentioned, in Spain, has Tara been laid low is how this is introduced. Donal is identified as the hopes for all of Ireland and the poet turns his fate into the fate of the nation. Um, the house of Dunboy has fallen. Um, the poet dwells in the physical decay of the castle, the necessity of a Gaelic aristocracy to endure what's happened. The natural world shares in his, in his own grief and the grief has impacted not only the nobles of, of Munster but also the Spanish and the English. And then we begin, he starts with the image of Donal as the defender of Ireland as a whole, and there works into uh, an apologue drawing upon um, Hector's defense of Troy, that while Hector still lived, and this I can see is drawn out for about uh, 10 quatrains or so, uh, in again, this highly ornate uh, form of poetic language, that while he stood, um, Troy was 
untouchable and it was only after his death by a treacherous wound um, clearly drawing in the present to the past uh, with the, the murder of of Dolmo. Um, only after this that the Greeks are able to enter Troy and sack it with almost no casualties on their own. And from here, we return to the present, and the poet sets up the future that he imagines for Ireland, and in fact, for much of the country, the present. Contempt for the Catholic Church, the plundering of monasteries, and the imprisonment of the Gaelic leaders, uh, the plunder of her castles. Ireland has lost the strength to defend herself, and the sailors who can travel past formerly needed to be armed in case the Irish would, um, would raid them. Now they can do this un unhindered. And the final quatrains restate this equation. Donal is Hector, Ireland as a whole is Troy. So I'm aware that I have probably spoken for longer than I should have, but I wanna just offer some very tentative conclusions. Uh, first um, is this notion of the conservatism of the, uh, of the bardic mind, we might say, which is um, stated by various scholars, including James Carney in the study of Eohio Hyosa. We see in the 16th and 17th centuries, a renewed interest in classical tradition. So it's not, I think this shows that it's not accurate to point to the Irish bardic poets as being hidebound conservatives, conservatives who were incapable of dealing with changes that the, that the modern world brought, uh, but rather that they are adapting in various ways. And one of these is to engage with a general European neoclassicism and bringing the various resources of the past to bear on the present situation. Um, at least some of them were sophisticated men of letters who were able to, to draw on these resources and form fairly sophisticated allegories. Um, and I should point as well that there's a distinct confessional nature to this poem as well, which is bringing the Trojan War into a, uh, the Trojan War into not only an ethnic conflict but a religious one. And the popularity of the Roman Civil War in this poetry as well can perhaps be seen in light of this a, a conflict with uh, a fairly com complex alliances in which no one can be unambiguously seen as um, as the, the good guys, so to speak, uh, is I think very, very fitting in an Ireland which is uh, tied, which is torn by small scale conflicts and um, uh, and ambivalent uh, political aff affiliations between neighbors, ethnic groups, religious, uh, religious divisions and the crown. <laughs> Within the 16th and 17th century in other literatures as well, we find frequent charges of barbarism brought against the Irish. These are made by earlier authors such as the Anglo, such as the Norm, the Anglo-Norman Gerald of Wales, or the Cambro Norman Gerald of Wales, I should, I should really say, but are repeated again and again in the works of early modern English historians. And the reappropriation of the classical past seems one way to combat this perception. And we can note also other projects such as the uh, John Colgan's Acta Sanctorum Hiberniae, the collection of the lives of Irish saints, Geoffrey Keating's Foris Fassa or Erin, uh, which is an explicit attempt to repudiate some of these claims, and Philip O'Sullivan Beer's own works. Um, I should mention Philip O'Sullivan Beer was the nephew of Dole. Uh, perhaps a little bit relevant there. Uh, <clears throat> there's also an interesting sort of ethnic dimension here to this uh, conflict between Greeks and Trojans and how this maps into conflict between English and Irish or Irish and Norman. Um, Irish, the Irish, as I mentioned, claim descent from Greeks, while other European peoples often claim descent from the Trojans. Uh, including um, the British crown, which appropriated this narrative from Geoffrey of Monmouth, who saw um, the name Britain as deriving from Brutus, one of Aeneas's followers, at least in that tradition. I had initially, when I began looking at this, uh, suggesting to suppose that there might have been an, an ethnic dimension to these identifications in the poetry, that perhaps Trojan identifications had more to do with Anglo-Norman patrons, um, the so-called Old English, and Greek ones with uh, Gaelic ones, um, but this was not the case. And curiously, while poets never claim Trojan ancestry per se, they're happy to claim Greek ancestry to claim that their patrons are descended from Greeks. They won't do this for Trojans, but they are nonetheless happy to conflate both Gaelic and Old English patrons with both Greek and Trojan heroes. And I wonder, um, of course, one explanation is that I'm thinking about this far more than poets did, but I don't really like that, but these are very carefully thought out works. Uh, these are very carefully constructed works. And I'd like to think that things that occur in them mean something. And I'm wondering if this is a way of appropriating British claims to, or English claims to Trojan ancestry or a reappropriation of this, a claiming of this back uh, and by extension of Roman power um, and perhaps a, ref a ref 
repudiation of the English British claims to translatio imperi, the rightful sort of ownership of world power. On top of this, also uh, perhaps claiming a closer distant, a closer connection to the worlds of the ancient Mediterranean, as well as in this confessional context, um, contemporary Rome. And in light of that, we can turn back to our 20th century critics and ask if that's really all that different, an attempt to revindicate a formerly despised and um, neglected and marginalized cultural identity within reference to a series of texts which exist in the center of the Western European canon. And uh, apologies for going over time, but that is what I had to say. Thank you.